It's good to see everybody this morning. I uh, hope y'all had a good week so far. It's been uh, spring break for me, and uh, that's a good thing. Uh, unfortunately, just like with most spring breaks, you don't get caught up like you want to. You never actually do. Um, you find out that there's more stuff that you have as the deeper you get into it, and that's why you hope for summer break so that you can get all the stuff done, and then you find out that you can't even cover everything during summer break. So uh, I guess the day I get caught up is the day that I will leave this world, I suppose. Um, if we look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy 2, 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, a couple of months ago, I was um, thinking this verse out a lot and thinking, I need to be studying more. I need to be looking. And then I had the idea, I had the bright idea, I'm sure it's real bright, that I was going to um, send a letter out to all my colleagues at work asking them what they had heard about the church of Christ, the things that we do or don't do. You know, and try to see what people outside of the Church of Christ think about what we do. Are there any things that they don't understand? Are there things that are false things that people say about us that they say we do? And here lately we've been looking at all these nights and videos about that, about things that have been said that are inaccurate about what we believe. Uh, so I got to thinking about that and said, you know what, let's, let's do a study on that. So I sent that letter out to everybody at, at work, and I got several responses back. And last month we had the first lesson, and it was called, Why Y'all Do That? Questions about the Church of Christ. Why do we do the things that we do? Now, number one on the list was musical instruments. And that was last month while we talked about musical instruments. And the fact that God has given us a pattern, and we try to follow the pattern as best we can. And that's what we want to continue with today, with our questions talking about the pattern. Because the next thing that I saw most often was, and one of the major ones that I saw at least two or three times, was about baptism. And the question was, why do y'all consider baptism as essential for salvation? That was one that I had, I just about took it word for word. Why do y'all consider it essential for salvation? Now, I want to go back again to the idea and the definition of the word baptism. So what is baptism? Well, if you look at the original Greek, the word is baptizo. Now, remember, if you've ever seen Greek letters, they're not English letters. So they had to transliterate the word from Greek into English. And this is the word that came from it, the word baptizo. And the word baptizo is a derivative, and it means to make weld. That is fully wet. Y'all ever been overwhelmed with something? If any of us has ever been overwhelmed with something, and we've been overwhelmed, it feels like you're drowning, doesn't it? If you've ever been swimming like we were when we were kids, I mean, not so long ago either, get in the water, especially the first time we didn't know how to swim, and you get up above the water above your head, you know, go in the pool or something, you go, I can't go over that side. Why? That's an eight. What's the eight got to do with it? Oh, I'm a six. That's an eight. I can't do that. I'll get overwhelmed. So the word means to make wells, to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge. Now again, this is from Strong's Concordance. This is the definition that was given. And if you look at several other concordances, go ahead. They'll basically say the same idea. So when we look at the word baptism, that's what it's referencing. The immersion. The submergence. Now, remember how last time we said God has a pattern? There's patterns in everything that we see. There's a pattern in life. This is a picture of a plant that I found online yesterday as I was looking and if you'll notice, this thing has a beautiful pattern to it. It's got a whirl pattern to it. Nobody made this plant in this form. 
God created this pattern for this plan. And another thing that we looked at last time was math. Remember the, the thing that I showed you with math, that 1 times 1 is 1, and 11 times 11 is 121, and 111 times 111 is 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, and it was a pattern. Well, there's other patterns in math, and this is another one that I found that was very similar to it. If you take 0 times 9 plus 1, now I'm not good at our order of operations, but I'm assuming it's the multiplication first. Well, 0 times 9 is 0, plus 1 is 1. Well, what is 1 times 9 plus 2? It's 11. 12 times 9 plus 3 is 111. 123 times 9 plus 4 is 1,000. You see the pattern here? There's patterns in everything that we see in our life. Every day we have a pattern or something. You have a pattern every morning when you get up, I guarantee you. We get up, minus to stumble over three cats because they won't get up when I want to get up. And the first thing I have to do, if I don't do this, I'm going to be in trouble. My pattern is I've got to go feed them first thing in the morning. They're going to, they're going to gripe at me and complain. The next thing is to go try to wash my face to see what in the world's going on with me right now. There's patterns in everything that we do. We just don't sometimes pay attention to them because they are part of our life. They are a pattern. Well, you know, this is the thing that we've talked about. God has a pattern for salvation. Now today, as we do every Sunday, we discuss and we, we teach and we preach on what God wants us to be. What he wants us to do. And that was the thinking from this is, how do I teach people on a subject that is a huge subject? I mean, this is a very large subject. And trying to keep it in 35, 40 minutes is going to be difficult for most people. Because you can't cover everything in 35 to 40 minutes. They've had 35 hours, we might can cover everything. I'm not going to stay here and preach y'all for 35 hours. No, ma'am, I'm not going to do it. But God has a pattern. And we as Christians want to try to follow a pattern as much as we can. Because again, it's not what I want when it comes to worship. It's what God wants. You've seen this, the, the bumper stickers. Attend the church of your choice, right? Well, I had a friend that I was at this weekend up in Tennessee. He had a, a, a license plate that had attend the church of Christ's choice. We need to be teaching and preaching and doing the things that Christ wants us to do. And God has a pattern for our salvation. You know, he had a pattern with the patriarchy, didn't he? He had a pattern when it came to the Mosaic law. He has a pattern for Jesus. That's why Jesus came, to give us the pattern and to die for our sins. So he's given us a pattern for salvation. Number one on the list, as we all know, is we got to hear. How can you become a Christian if you've never heard God's word? That'd be like, and again, this is obviously for rhetorical. It'd be like me going out and saying, I'm a Muslim now, and I've never read the Quran. That ain't gonna work, is it? It'd be like, well, I'm gonna teach biology. Have you, do you know what biology is? No, I don't know what biology is. Can't do that. I've got to hear the word of God. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You've got to hear God's word in order to have faith. There's no doubt about it. John 6, verse 45 says, It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. You have to learn of God. How can you come to God if you've never learned about Him? You can't. The next thing we have to do, as we've already seen in Romans 10, is we have to have faith. We have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now that sounds kind of ridiculous for most people. Well, of course you do. But how can you believe if you've never heard? 
John 3, 16, we can all quote that verse backwards and forwards. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If we believe in God, we shouldn't perish. John 8, 24 says, I said it therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for you, if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Jesus tells him here, if you don't believe that I am the Son of God, you're going to die in your sins. Belief is essential. <laughs> I don't think any Christian denomination can deny that, that belief is essential. You have to be able to believe in God. Otherwise, what's the point? You have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Otherwise, how can you be a Christian? Another thing that we have to do, we live in a horrible world. I got a text this morning from a friend who put a picture up of sunrise in West Texas or Central or the Panhandle of Texas. And you could barely you could hardly see the sun coming up but you saw that beautiful star still sitting there right before daylight. I think actually it was Venus but anyway. He said what a beautiful sight. I said yes but compared to heaven this place is a garbage dump. We live in a garbage dump. Again, I was going to Tennessee this past weekend, last weekend, and saw how beautiful this world actually is. But compared to heaven, it's a garbage dump. And the world we live in causes us to do things that, and allows us to do things that we shouldn't be doing. To believe a sinful life. And we have to repent. We have to say, I'm not going to do that anymore. I am not going to keep doing those things that have separated me from God. Because my, we know that our sins have separated us from God. Jesus here says in Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. If we don't change our ways and say, we're not going to keep doing those old sinful things anymore, we're going to perish. We have to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. We have to confess because, again, that lets the world know who Jesus is. And that we believe that He is who He says He is. Matthew 10, 32 says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Now that's not as big a deal as it is today as it was 2,000 years ago. To confess that Jesus was the Son of God, 2001st century, very well meant that you were either going to go to jail or be beaten or possibly even killed. And one day that may mean the same thing here. We see the signs, don't we? We see the idea that people are not accepting of Christianity as much anymore. Romans 10, verse 9. Paul writes that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And that is a condition of salvation, isn't it? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we see that those four things are necessary, aren't they? How can you be a Christian if you have not done these things? Well, I want to look at our main scripture today. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus here is writing. He says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Not some, but all power. Keep that in mind for the rest of the day. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's everybody. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. 
That is what we as Christians are to do. To teach. Go out into the world teaching all nations. We're baptizing into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Not in the name of Muhammad, not in the name of Buddha, not in the name of Confucius. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now if you look to Mark, <coughs> there's a parallel scripture that says basically the same thing. Mark 16. Starting at verse 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now didn't he mean go preach to your dog? You know, at that time, Jews, which is who we primarily talk to, considered Gentiles less than, didn't they? We as Gentiles were considered less than. We were not good enough. We were looked down upon by the Jewish nation. So he says, preach the gospel to every creature, everyone. Say, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. If you don't believe in the Son of God, you have no salvation. So I'm sorry to all the Muslims. I'm sorry to all the Buddhists and the Confucius and whatever. Sorry. I don't care what Oprah Winfrey says, that there are many ways to get to heaven. Oprah's going to have to stand before the Lord too, just like the rest of us. So what are we teaching today? We as Christians are trying to teach the gospel. Now, there's a lot of theories and a lot of things on what the gospel is. <coughs> Excuse me. But we're going to look at it as plain and simple as we can get. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul here writes, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. By which also you are saved if, see that word you have? That's a little small letter, a small word, isn't it? A two word letter. But that word is important. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. We know the word gospel means good news. The good news, now it doesn't sound good, does it? Because we talked about what the cross means a couple of weeks ago. To someone in the first century, that cross meant something horrible, didn't it? It meant a brutal, awful death. But it means something more to us. Because we know the good news is that Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and then he rose again the third day. And then without that, we could not have hope for salvation. That's what we as Christians are teaching. We're teaching the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Isn't that simple? All Christians should be teaching this, shouldn't they? There are some groups that aren't teaching this. See how they call themselves Christians that they're not teaching that Christ died and was buried and rose again. So now we'll look at how do we baptize? Again, remember we said the word baptizo means to well, to immerse. We'll look at Acts chapter 8. Do we remember the story? Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. We remember the story, don't we? Acts chapter 8, verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. Philip had been told to go down and find this Ethiopian eunuch. Now, this Ethiopian eunuch was a man of high dealings. He was a very influential man. So he gets down there, and what's what he says? They've been teaching him. He says, look, he came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hindereth me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you can. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ 
is the Son of God. So we have belief and we have confession, don't we? In verse 38 says, And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. See, somewhere along the lines, Philip taught that Jesus was the Son of God. You know, the eunuch was reading from the Old Testament the prophecy of Jesus. He was reading that prophecy. Philip taught him about that prophecy had come to fruition with Jesus and said, this is what has happened. This is what you need to do. When they passed by a creek or a river, whatever it was, he said, what's it? What's keeping me from doing this? He said, if you believe, you can. He said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They both went down in the water, they both went, and he baptized them. Now, how again? Let's look at the idea of this water. There was a lot of water there. There is much water. Look at John chapter 3. Because we have the differences... Some groups, and again, I don't know which one specifically. I know a couple of them, but they go to the idea of sprinkling as baptism. I want to look again at some of the things with the word baptizo, to overwhelm or to whelm. Look at John chapter 3, verse 23. You remember John the Baptist, the baptizer? He was baptizing, he was baptizing for repentance, the baptism of repentance. And it says, and John also was baptizing in Aeneum near to Selim, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. There had to be a lot of water there because he was baptizing a lot of folks. Couldn't do it. But there wasn't a lot of water. Now, look at what happened, though. Because here's the thing. Christ, you know, we use Christ as an example for everything in our life. He was perfect. He was sinless. We can't be that way. Every day we probably sin somewhere, either through committing a sin or, for, or not doing something that we should do, a sin of omission. Probably every day. I doubt very seriously we can go a day without sinning. He went 33 years without sinning. He is that example to us. That is how we <coughs> are to strive to be. We know we'll never make it there, but we are striving. But look at this. He gives us an example. Christ gives us this example. Matthew 13, or excuse me, 3 verse 13. <coughs> excuse me. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan and John to be baptized of him. You mean even Jesus was baptized? Yes. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? I'm the one that needs to be baptized, not you. And you're coming to me? Well, look at verse 15. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he suffered. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened up unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. This must have been an incredible scene. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. See, that's what Jesus did. He gave us the example. That it must be done for righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness. Jesus didn't have any sin. But he gave us the pattern. He gave us the example. So why should we be baptized? Because it is commanded. Look at John 14 verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, 
Do what I've commanded you to do. That's all. That's all. Isn't that simple? If you truly love me, then do what I ask you to do. Nothing more, nothing less. Do what I ask you to do. John 14, verse 21 says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, <coughs> and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. about 1 John 5. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous.